Good day and welcome to the Adam Smith Institute, the UK's leading neoliberal think tank. I just want to take the opportunity to thank our donors and supporters for making events like this possible and to you, our online community, who attend these events from right around the world. Today, we've got people dialing in from New Zealand, South Africa, Switzerland, Hong Kong, America, right across the EU, and of course, right across the UK. We're going to be discussing one of the hot topics in Britain right now, trade. For the first time in over 40 years, Britain has competency over trade again. And one of the first ports of call were our dearest friends over the pond in America. But how are the free trade agreement negotiations going? Are we stuck? Do we have any idea of if a deal is likely or even possible? And what are the big stumbling blocks that we can see coming down the road? To discuss this and more, I'm joined by Mark Bush. Mark Bush is the Carl F. Landegger Professor of International Business Diplomacy at the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. And he's an expert on trade, international trade policy and law. He previously served for two terms as a cleared advisor on technical trade barriers to the US Department of Commerce and the United States Trade Representative. He's a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. He also hosts the podcast Tradecraft, available on iTunes and SoundCloud and all other good podcast subscribers services, but then examines current topics in international trade law and policy. Good day to you, Mark. How are you doing on this fine, fine day in October? I'm well, thanks, Matt. How are you? I'm very well. It's very much a different atmosphere here in London, which is facing another series of lockdowns um, as the pandemic rages into its second wave, uh, whilst America appears to sort of be getting back to normal um, after having sort of, well, as normal as it can be during an election year, eh, Mark? Indeed. Um, and why not? Why not start on that theme? The American election is well underway. Uh, the two sides very much at loggerheads. I doubt very much whether the British trade uh, negotiations have featured, but have, have they featured in a big way for you? Um, and do you think that the two sides are diametrically opposed on any of the, on the sort of substantial issue of getting a deal with the UK? Well, Matt, you're absolutely right that in the context of the election, trade is typically framed as being about China. And it's considered to be an alternative means of demonstrating toughness with respect to Beijing. We're not hearing an awful lot about trade. And generally speaking, trade is a low salience issue in American politics. But Trump has offered trade as the litmus test for being willing to stand up to China. And it would appear that both Biden and some of its surrogates are taking the apple. Namely, they want to argue that while Trump has been rather ad hoc in his use of tariffs, they might actually be more nimble in using tariffs. And that's a bit of a worrying sign. But definitely at 34,000 feet, the Biden campaign has been talking about reestablishing better connections with our allies and doing things that would have sounded like a traditional Republican would have been saying. But then again, these aren't traditional Republican times. US-UK is going to go on regardless of what happens in November. US-UK has been in motion for many years, going back to the high-level working group. It has enthusiastic sponsorship. And it really is an interesting bit of detail for the United States to contemplate in as much as, as you say, Britain now has competency over trade. It's no longer in the hands of Brussels. You have this moment where you have a blank slate. And the really big question is, can the US-UK deal look interesting up against WTO text or not? And that will be the big question for whoever wins in November. What kind of deal? There will be a deal, but what kind of deal are we talking about? And of course, you know, we realize a little bit on what kind of a deal the UK gets with the European Union, um, or if it has one at all in the next uh, nine days, officially. I'm not sure that anyone really believes that timescale, but nine days officially. Um, I was wondering, do you see the stumbling block over the UK um, and Irish border being a real issue, a salient issue for trade policy between the USTR and the UK negotiators? It definitely gets mentioned a lot. It has definitely drawn congressional review in the number of hearings that we had in the United States this summer before both House Ways and Means and Senate Finance. You heard references to it. I think that you're seeing, though, that this is being taken up at the tactical level. This is going to be taken up by those who are best able in the professional staff to handle the fallout from the question. But like you say, uh, everything that the U.S. thinks about in terms of U.S.-U.K. depends on what the U.K. does with the E.U. <laughs> 
Uh, like everything in life, it's very much a chicken and egg situation, isn't it, Mark? And That's right. Um, do you think that the kind of bilateral deals that the UK is seeking with America and which Trump has trumpeted as sort of at the heart of his trade policy is the future of trade? Or is there more broad-based multilateralism or is there plurilateralism at the WTO level that has a future as well? Well, as you say, the Trump administration came to office claiming that its approach was going to be very strategic, very precise, and they were going to go the bilat route instead of engaging at the WTO. Funny enough, Lighthizer, the ambassador for the United States Trade Representative, testified this summer that that really isn't working. And therein lies a lesson for the UK. I seriously doubt that the UK will have the capacity to negotiate the 40 plus trade deals that would be required to keep pace with the European Union. Here in the United States, we lag the EU by 30 trade deals. We have the largest trade bureaucracy on earth and we can scarcely pretend to be able to negotiate three deals simultaneously. So if anything, I would imagine that there will be, assuming reform gets some traction at the WTO, much more conversation about the need for plurilaterals. And we've got a base there. We have the trade and services agreement plurilateral. We have the environmental goods agreement plurilateral. You have the conclusion recently of the information technology agreement part two. This is all very promising in terms of the plurilateral approach. And it has to be the favored way by virtue of the fact that nobody has the capacity to do one-off bilats especially when they're 30 trade deals down, or in the UK's case, 44 trade deals down. <laughs> Do you think that part of that is about the, the desire to try and force standards, try and force regulations? Is there any way in which actually a smaller country, such as the UK, who's willing to take on uh, more imports or more standards from elsewhere on a mutually recognized basis might be able to have a bit more nobility uh, when it comes to negotiating, because it will be able to accept a lot more? Uh, than domestically or not. There's no doubt that the UK has to build up capacity and do it very, very quickly. There's simply no substitute for that. But in the context of being a small country, I can't help but reflect on the experience of Canada, which is incredibly astute at negotiating very complicated trade deals. The issue isn't so much doing line by line swaps of the substance of a given standard. It really is about especially in the context of US, UK, buying into what the United States considers WTO plus, meaning really science-based approaches to regulatory measures. And in all honesty, whether or not the US and the UK ever entertain the prospect of a bilat, the UK is gonna discover this in a big way simply by virtue of being a WTO member. <laughs> and the litmus test for an independent capacity in London will be, can you follow along the recent case filed by Canada against China on genetically modified canola? If that case makes sense in London, then that's a real positive sign. But that's the future. And that's what the complexity of science-based regulatory measures when litigated looks like at the WTO. And let's speak a bit more about those because those science-based litigation measures at the WTO are likely to play quite large in British politics for a few years to come. I'm thinking very clearly of chlorinated chicken and hormone beef. A lot of these are going through litigation that the EU has pretended as a domestic political matter, but which the WTO rules would actually mean that they're signed up to believe, like to accepting the scientific basis of the litigation as well, right? So how much can we rely on these big, like fractious issues politically uh, being sorted out by agencies far, far away from, from the political discussion. The independent capacity that London pieces together is going to have to get very good on what the European Union has failed to fill in, namely the science with respect to chlorinated chicken. The irony is that the EU since 2004 has had the concern about chlorine. It's not just chlorine. It's actually six risks times four chemicals, and they've got eight studies, and they're batting one four in terms of actually doing what the WTO requires, namely a proper risk assessment. So in short, Europe has no science. The question is, can, the e can an independent UK come up with science to justify a risk that they seem willing to run 
with respect to fruits and vegetables, as well as imports from Thailand and Brazil. But for some reason, they've made this narrative about chlorine chicken from the United States, as if we don't love our children too, and have offered this as a means of keeping it out. Now, the British press gets clever because they point out, well, it's not really that we fear that chlorine doesn't work. In fact, the EU demonstrated long ago that it does work. The British media like to hype up the fact that, well, it may mask for other bad things. Problem is the EU looked into this in the early 2000s and found no evidence of it, but did find evidence of it in the case of Thailand and Brazil, which happened to be favored suppliers of poultry into the EU. The key is this, you have to have science and you have to apply it in a non-discriminatory way. And we in the United States witnessed a case filed against the EU in 2009 on chlorinated chicken. The case lapsed largely for politics reasons. Now it's up to the UK to take upon itself the burden of figuring out this science for itself. Independence and regulatory independence at that comes with a cost. And let's see what London does with this one. But it's gonna be a bad case to make a stand on. And I gotta say, uh, Boris Johnson's effort to offer a two-tier tariff system as the answer goes right to the point feared in the United States that there is no science to this and no health risk to this. There is no way that a two-tier tariff is an answer to a health and safety issue. <laughs> and does that two-tier tariff then become a real sticking point in the negotiations? Does it become a real red line for the United States? I don't know whether it's going to be encouraging or discouraging because the fact is the price point will be certainly intriguing in the minds of US exporters. I can tell you what the answer has to be one day and we've known this for a very, very long time. Let's have more audits of US poultry but let's also have a label such that British consumers at point of sale can tell the difference. That is the answer. We know that's the answer, but the narrative has outstripped reality now for several decades. I find that very interesting because the, one of the things that's quite often brought up here, it quite, quite often in the debate about chlorine chicken, it's what's known as a Morton Bailey discussion, right? Where you say it's about uh, the pathogen reduction treatments and they go, oh yeah, we, know, we accept that those are safe, but it's really about animal welfare standards. So he talks about animal welfare standards and America's history with the farm to fork, uh, you know, community, make, making sure that like free to roam, free to range uh, food as well, massive, massive things in the United States. And obviously one of the most litig litigious societies on the planet in terms of increasing um, standards. But, but a lot of it is like, well, you talk about that, then they immediately move back on to, oh, but it's chlorine. Um, and it's really, a, it's very, a, an unfair debate. Do you think that there's like, what way and can Americans sell themselves in British media to prove that actually that the products that they're selling are just as good as the ones that they're getting here, if not better in some cases. Like how are, we, how are, they, how are they able to defeat the PR machine of, of those who want to shut down free trade? The most obvious thing to point out though is that Europeans actually digest and have greater dietary exposure to chlorine in their water and their fruits and their vegetables. So when you take a look at high risk populations throughout the EU, they're far greater they're, they have far greater exposure in terms of dietary intake to chlorine through these other means. The reality is that the science has to be laid bare and we do have standards, global scientific standards in place that like HACCP demonstrate the critical establishment of verification along the food chain to demonstrate what is and isn't happening. Audit. Let the UK audit, let the EU audit. They have already been auditing since the early 2000s. They know that the US is uh, ha HACCP compliant. There isn't a lot of mystery here, but you're right. It is a bit of a moving target because EU legislation pinpoints six different risk factors. So you begin to play a whack-a-mole game where you keep moving on from one to another until the EU settles in. Ironically, though, the EU doesn't have any science except for one, and that's on trisodium phosphate potentially in the sewage system. That's it. That's it. So the narrative, like I said, has completely outstripped reality, and it's time to let the scientists and others do what they do. And moreover, when I say there's no science, I don't mean there's no American science. I mean there's no European science. It's not like this is a question about whose science is right. 
Europe has been looking into the issue since the early 2000s. They have found nothing. It's one of those scary things that consumers latch, latch on to, but they don't realize how much of this is already out there and what, what the risk is of not doing the rinse. And the potable water rinse isn't actually bearing out much fruit. Mm. And I wonder as well, because a lot of the, the, so the FDA has, you know, certain parts per million of certain uh, chemicals that in there sounds very scary. Uh, the European Union doesn't use the same. And actually, one of the things that you do is you say, you know, how many insect parts per million you can have in a certain vat, etc. The European Union doesn't do that. It just uses pure chemical methods. Um, and so they're non-comparable. How, but, but let's be honest, if you're making a big vat of orange juice, or you're making a big vat of cider or olive oil, and you haven't managed to get some bugs from the field into it, I'd be incredible. Firstly, I'd be very worried because <laughs> where on earth are you growing these things? Uh, but secondly, like, I don't, I just don't believe you. Um, I wonder, like, how does the US, and in many ways the UK now as well, impress on the EU the, des the need and the desire for, to have comparable systems so that exporters can, can trade freely between one another rather than just on a protectionist inter-market inter basis. That's absolutely right. But let's not conflate the effort to find an end game like that with harmonization. No one is asking for anybody to harmonize their regimes per se. What is being asked for by the WTO, mind you, is that there be an appropriate level of protection specified in the regulatory measure, that there be a proper real world based risk assessment done on what the measure actually will do to achieve that appropriate level of protection. And on this front, Europe has nothing up its sleeves. And that's where the UK comes in. If you want to play the game on chlorinated chicken, or for that matter, I think that the much bigger question going forward will be, what does the UK do on endocrine disruptors? If they follow the EU lead, that will be devastating in terms of global trade. But we'll see shortly because that one's going to come to a play shortly in terms of WTO action. In the context of chlorinated chicken, though, let's let the science speak for itself and let's use those international institutions like Codex that have been looking at the matter for many, many years. It mm. shouldn't be that we de novo experience a new rush of sanity. We know what this stuff is. We know why it's used. We know what it can do. And moreover, we know that whatever's on it, it's also on your uh, fruits and vegetables and in your drinking water. I suppose the, the one of the phrases that I hear more and more often, uh, especially in British media, is the phrase race to the bottom. Uh, it's used by mostly left-wing politicians. It's sometimes used by nationalists here in the United Kingdom uh, because we've got an internal markets bill that's setting the new standards for the single market here in the UK. Uh, and it's decided that if you use equivalent standards between different places, different legislatures, that you end up with this race to the idea of standards going down, down, down to the one that can produce it at the lowest price. Um, I'm not sure that that's correct, but I was wondering if you think that that's correct, if you think that there's a way that that might actually happen, or do you think actually that people trusting legislatures to work for you know, the interests of their own consumers, um, are they likely to actually push up standards in rich countries? Actually, there's no trade trigger that looks like a race to the bottom, and there's no empirical evidence that there is a race to the bottom, least of all among rich countries. It's a race to the top. And in terms of the trade discussion, and that's what we're having here, the reality is that our fear is that you use a race to the top as a disguised restriction on trade. That is what the sanitary and phytosanitary agreement of the WTO is designed to pick apart. It is not concern for a race to the bottom. We just don't see that. What we see instead is that for protectionist reasons, you race to the top you exceed a codex standard in an effort to insulate the domestic market from imports by virtue of the fact that only your producers locally can achieve that higher than codex global standard. That's what we see. And that's the experience in US EU trade writ large. We don't see races to the bottom. We see and have to deal with through litigation races to the top. And do you think, I think this is one that comes up very regularly within the UK is an idea of the um, sort of the red lines here in the UK that come up very regularly are, um, is the NHS safe? Um, I wonder, A, whether the Americans even know what the NHS actually does <laughs> or is, um, and is it for sale? And do you guys even want to buy it, Mark? 
I got to tell you, I grew up in Canada and I used to hear this line all the time that free trade with the United States starting in 1989, when the bilat preceded NAFTA by a number of years, was going to cost Canada its public health system. Uh, bullshit. There's absolutely no merit to it. In fact, Canada doesn't even negotiate health at the, at the WTO level. There is nothing on offer at the WTO in terms of health and Canada doesn't really want to sell its healthcare system in any PTA either. No, no one wants to buy NHS and no one wants to invade the idea of traded services though and being able to contribute to NHS, that's an interesting question. But for services writ large, again, the UK is gonna have some offensive and defensive concerns and that's why you hope that services will be taken not in a piecemeal approach, but in a systematic way. Given that as UK clamors for the opportunity to compete in US financial services markets, that there are ways like in the case of reading radiology or something with respect to hospitals, US providers could deliver for NHS. Yes. Now, before I open up to questions, please do send them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Uh, it should be open to you guys if you want to send them in or the Zoom webinar chat will do exactly the same thing. I just wanted to ask one last thing. The, um, a lot of the time, you know, trade deals are by their nature semi-mercantilist because you are negotiating on a national basis. You don't want to let too much in. You don't want to let too much out. Um, and therefore, they're sort of tit for tat. What level of unilateralism should the UK take an approach to? And what should we, what can we learn from things like every, uh, everything but arms trade and generalized system of preferences with poorer countries um, to reduce trade barriers whole, wholesale um, without needing to get something as a win in return? My hope is that the generalized system of preferences goes away eventually. And I think that the empirical literature demonstrates that it's done very little good for the recipient countries on GSP, including everything but arms. The reality is that we have to get away from this very Trumpian mindset that a trade agreement is kind of an ad hoc arrangement of managed trade. I'm hopeful that one day we'll return to the view that as per what the WTO says, these trade deals should be substantially all trade and should be no more trade restrictive than is necessary. And really, the baseline for the UK is the same as the baseline for the United States. Namely, if the deal isn't WTO+, plus, why are we doing it? So when I served as a clear advisor for USTR, our line on the technical barriers to trade chapter was always the same. Either deliver us WTO+, plus or don't bother. Why anyone would want to rediscover or reinvent the wheel, I don't know. We're already both members of the WTO. If we're going to dabble in a bilat, let's make it deeper and more comprehensive than the WTO. Let's not reinvent the WTO. And let's stay away from these ad hoc, almost barter-based trade deals that we have seen come to be in vogue of late. And I am worried that, moreover, the language, the language of trade agreements has been corrupted over the past few years. We really are to the point now where barter and a cessation of hostilities is subbing in for our broader notions of what a trade agreement is supposed to do. Do it WTO plus or stay at home. <laughs> I like that. I do wonder as well, actually, just before we do that, we go, do you think like things like TPP, uh, sorry, CPTPP um, represents a new model for trade? Or do you think that this represents like an undermining of the broader based WTO by having these you know, effective splinter groups that are basically doing the same job, but a little bit further? If you get pockets like with TPP, which when the United States was bound to join, we were talking 40% of global trade, doing things on a WTO plus basis, that's great. And I have to say that I was impressed by the text that was written for the technical barriers to trade chapter for TPP, and for that matter, the sanitary and phytosanitary chapter. I don't think that it's a problem when you get that kind of critical mass talking WTO plus. It is essentially a synonym for getting a plurilateral at the WTO in a way. It's just that you have a more precarious process by which you have more countries join than would be true if you did it at the WTO. If the WTO gets reformed and if we have some life breathed back into the institution such that the plurilaterals are happening in Geneva, great. 
But if you're going to start doing a deal that looks like TPP, the only way it should ever serve as a template is if it runs deeper and broader than the WTO. And on several of the chapters that were evident at the time the U.S. was in on the action, that's exactly what it did. But minus that, it's really not worth the candle. This is really what it all brings into this point. But um, cyto, uh, phyto and uh, you know, got, uh, sanitary and phytosanitary um, standards are likely to be a bit of a flashpoint in any form of deal that the UK does with the EU or no deal in the event uh, that there is no one because A, of the big border that the UK has with the Republic of Ireland, but also between uh, goods, uh, food goods and animal goods between uh, the continent, especially the Netherlands and the UK, uh, where we get a lot of our chicken from. Um, do you, what does what does the CPTPT sorry CPTPP uh, chapter on SPS say, and why is it an improvement? And is it something that like is there a way in which the UK can bridge a gap between uh, some of the some of the broader based sort of EU led issues with the idea of having any forms of trade with food um, going forward? The WTO set out a very good and very cogent SPS chapter, and it makes reference to three institutions under the UN system that inform global science. What CPTPP does to extend this is it sets out criteria for evaluating science-based regimes. And moreover, it talks about having an awful lot more effort at trying to not harmonize, but get some dialogue such that we experience national treatment with respect to each other's different efforts to minimize risk. That's a big improvement. Moreover, what I really like and what British consumers should take confidence in is that the TBT and the SPS chapters come along with committees that are assigned to do problem solving shy of litigation. These give ample opportunity for countries to work out their problems long before they're hitting the newspaper's front page. And that's a very valuable exercise. Think of it as a very well-informed alternative dispute resolution mechanism. We already at the WTO use the committees, especially on SPS, to do a lot of heavy lifting. And if you add in more science, as CPTPP does, and as the TTIP agreement was set to do, namely the deal between the US and the EU, then you're talking about things that you can really talk about in committee. And that's very valuable. Not everything should be going to court and there should be means by which countries can work out their differences. And that is where we start this very difficult task. And admittedly, that's what it is, a difficult task of dealing with the most disguised restrictions, which at times have nothing to do with trade, but they have a trade effect. And we gotta be able to tell the difference between those that are legitimate public policy pursuing and those that are really disguised restrictions on trade. So a lot of the, a lot of trade negotiations are done on a basis of both being in the national interest uh, and therefore in a narrow interest and also by, but are done because you trust the other partner uh, quite implicitly or explicitly. Um, the US, of course, one of the oldest friends of the United Kingdom. Um, the UK hasn't had a trade policy for 40 years, but needs to do this massive negotiation now with as many friends as possible. Can the UK speed up trade negotiation by borrowing friendly negotiators from other friendly countries uh, who have large amounts of experience? Um, can they simply replicate existing trade deals? Can they tack on to some existing trade deals? Um, and can we just ask for some other terms that were given to the EU? Uh, this just comes from my boss, Eamon Butler, who's just down the, down the road. Um, does it, like, how can we actually leverage, instead of having this like mercantilist back and forth, tit for tat, how can we make sure that actually we set a new standard for trade that's about trusting the different partners that we're all negotiating with together? There's going to be a lot of need to fill a lot of jobs in the UK. There's no two ways about that. <laughs> You've already been seeing now, ever since the high level working group took effect, that both industry and government have been trying to fill a lot of vacant slots, a lot of slots that have been created de novo. No two ways about that. But there is science to be borrowed from abroad. There are templates to be borrowed from abroad. There is a lot that British citizens can be trained relatively quickly to get right. There is no substitute for the sheer level of experience that is held primarily by Canada, the EU, and the United States. But 
this is a very important trade deal for the US and the UK to get right. And it does pivot in relation to what both sides do with respect to the EU. And let's remember this, the floor here is gonna be set by the WTO. So it's important to get right, not just what we wanna do WTO plus, but an independent UK has now got to grapple with the burden of being a WTO member. And that means dealing with a lot of other countries that are also gonna be raising a lot of questions about things that look like chlorine rinse chicken, or for that matter, the big one, because the EU really does stand alone on this one, endocrine disruptors. Yes, and, I, and also you know, CRISPR and GMO as well, of course, very much. The, uh, my American colleague, Morgan, um, I think from a semi self-interested point of view, uh, wants to ask about what's the potential for the US lining up with the other English, Anglophone countries, you know, the, the, the Kansas states, um, as well as the United States. And is there anything that these countries could do or go a little bit further you know, maybe on uh, free movement more broadly, um, that maybe we can ask a little bit of a special favor, a special friends uh, to, to have that other, you know, wouldn't necessarily agree in, uh, exist in other trade, trade agreements. There's no two ways about it that, politically speaking, that trust factor that you keep referring to is important. For example, in US-Canada trade, it's one of the greatest explanations for why you've seen deeper relations than with the other trade partners that the United States enjoys through, say, WTO relations and elsewhere through its few PTAs, the preferential trade agreements. The answer here is actually not, not entirely in the hands of either the United States or the UK. In part, it's going to be playing catch up with the European Union. And I want to frame this in quite dramatic terms. The EU has a free trade deal with Canada. The EU has a free trade deal with Mexico. The US has a free trade deal with Canada and with Mexico. And what we should really be talking about, much like what happened in the Atlantic Charter that led to the discussions that created the GATT, really is a transatlantic trade corridor. Because the truth is the US can't really have USMCA function properly without completing the triangle, namely through TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership with Europe, and the UK should be getting in on that. And that's a lot of stuff. Rather than try and match the EU on 44 trade deals, if I was calling the shots in the UK, I've got two priorities, a transatlantic deal that looks like one that I just described, and then getting in on CPTPP. And, and uh, since you've got a couple members, namely Canada and Mexico, who are also in on CPTPP, imagine that that transatlantic corridor actually bridges a lot of the action. And of course, that presumably goes across both the Republicans and the Democrats in looking to constrain China's expansionist efforts in the Asia Pacific region, of course. That's right. And that was President Obama's sell of the Trans-Pacific Partnership way back when, when he offered his effort to try and get Congress a little bit interested, that it was important for the US to be writing the rules in a region where China's influence was becoming much more felt. Now, in the context of today, a lot of that is going to be the way in which the dialogue here in the United States changes gear as well, that to sell free trade at a time when Congress is largely exhausted by USMCA, you'll have to sell it in part as being a response to Chinese influence in South Asia and elsewhere. And again, since it's really hard to make USMCA work, given what our trade partners, Canada and Mexico, have done by themselves with the EU, if I was sitting at the table, I would be urging whatever it is that comes about by virtue of US, UK to be readily brought within a broader framework that is transatlantic with all of those groups together. And speaking of exhausting, uh, Malcolm War asks uh, about the, um, the IEEPA, which is the, the US Inter International Emergency Economic Powers Act, um, quite sweeping powers given to the president to regulate international commerce and trade. Is this something that is likely to come to an end at some point, or is this something that we have to consider in any revalidation of US-UK trade agreements? One thing is that obviously US-UK should not be scripting too many national security carves out, carve outs, and we're already seeing that we're getting a lot of action on national security, even at the WTO. We've got now two rulings in on national security. We had nothing from 47 until 2018. Now we have the Russia traffic and transit case and we have Qatar versus Saudi Arabia. 
The truth is that after the election, I would imagine that you will see the reappearance of bills introduced by both Republicans and Democrats to rein in some of this unilateralism. But unilateralism will have to be a theme taken up in WTO reform. It's something that we are seeing a lot of, and it's not just in the litigation. We're seeing this raised in committee by countless countries that are protecting everything from 5G to food security by invoking this term. And it really has to be put back in the genie bottle if that's at all possible. And the UK, of course, has its own issues on that front with you know, not just chlorine chicken as well and the NHS, uh, but things like the digital services tax, along with some other EU countries. Now, France was um, maybe stupidly um, explicit in calling it the big five tax uh, and then naming the companies and excluding the only French one that was in the list from being taxed. Uh, the UK is being a little bit more clever in terms of it saying, you know, it's really just about helping the high street. Uh, do you think this, do you see this as some commentators do as a tariff on American companies providing services in the UK? Absolutely. There's no other way to spin it. And the derogations, as you mentioned, with respect to the French carve out for a single domestic entity, always give it away. <laughs> so in terms of strict political economy terms, look for the derogations. It's as true in this case as it is in endocrine disruptors. The fact is that you always see what the real intent is by virtue of the way in which it was designed to exclude certain domestic players. My favorite thing is the, uh, at the end of the First World War, Kaiser Wilhelm wrote a series of memoirs in which he describes how Britain had got very angry and miserable about the fact that they'd been overtaken by Germany. Um, and the factories were much like what they'd been putting up protectionist measures. The factories were, you know, older, less useful, less reliable. Uh, and how, you know, they, they played by the same rules but every now and then Britain just pulls up a new trade barrier. Do you think that the EU is doing the same thing to, to poorer countries that are looking to, that they're looking like they're expanding at a quicker rate? And is the US yes, at risk of doing the same thing as well? That's right. Rich countries don't use tariffs, except for the Trump administration. Rich countries use non-tariffs and regulatory measures are optimal for the sake of doing this because they have the nuance such that they could be strategically tailored to a given industrial constituent, and they're hard to see because they don't work through prices. So all things equal, you're gonna have a rich country government preferring to go this route. What the UK should learn though from the Trump administration's experience playing the, two, three, the section 232 game is that efforts to resuscitate manufacturing by being protectionist typically backfire. And there is no US study done by any wing of the government that demonstrates that any of these tariffs have done anything to revitalize US manufacturing in any given sector. It's really tough in a global supply chain world to figure out the fallout from any given protectionist measure and nothing seems to be working in terms of everything from the steel and aluminum tariffs to some of the other requests that we've seen. And that's why you've got all this domestic litigation, which I doubt your listeners have heard much about. We have US industries now suing the Trump administration for overreach on section 232. We have great concerns on the part of even steel producers about what the steel tariffs are doing. So this has unraveled real fast and uh, there are lessons to be learned in that experience. I think, you it... I think you underestimate the listeners here, Mark, because I've got a question. The first question, in fact, I got in for this uh, webinar was, uh, we have the US, US retaliatory tariffs on single malt scotch under the Airbus dispute and the EU's 232 measures on Italia, American whiskies, doing massive damage on both sides of the Atlantic for, for industries that are basically poster children for free and fair trade. Right. What prospect do you see of a resolution on that? Do you see a resolution separate for the UK now it's left the EU or leaving the EU in two months fully? And on what timescales and what's needed on both sides to make that happen, no matter what happens in the election coming up? We need the Boeing Airbus dispute to be resolved. And obviously one important step in the direction was recently taken by virtue of the fact that the WTO authorized Europe now to retaliate up to 4 billion US dollars. I think you're seeing the start of a more vigorous conversation to bring about some answer to that. And obviously, like I said before, you've got people in both parties here in Congress writing legislation to rein in the 232 tariffs. So you've got momentum on both fronts. But 
what I think is really interesting right now is that you're seeing a brand new kind of trade problem. And I like to point to the lobster industry here in the United States. The lobster industry in Maine has been throttled recently, not by virtue of protectionist measures abroad, but by virtue of the fact that retaliatory tariffs plus free trade agreements between other countries than the United States and Europe have led to US lobsters falling far behind. That is the wake up call for all protectionist advocates to try and muddle through. There's no way around this. The, the barn door is wide open and you're not gonna close it. And the truth is President Trump has scrambled to offer concessions to the lobster industry, highest value added seafood export on offer from this country, can't do it because it keeps getting hit. One against China because of the section 301 tariffs, another against the European Union because of the 232 tariffs, Another because Canada and the EU have a free trade deal and the Maine lobsters are largely like their Canadian cousins. And then finally, because of Boeing Airbus. So you take this in toto and you've got just one big heap and mess. And that's the point that there's just no way to track all of this. And that's why trade liberalization has got to get more of a narrative that is palatable to your average voter and less esoteric language so that people understand what it is that they are voting for or against. And I can only hope that come November in this country, that the narrative will be better tailored by at least one of the two campaigns to try and convince Americans that it's one thing to stand tough on China. It's another thing to destroy global value chains upon which American businesses and American consumers at the end of the day are dependent. And I, I just want to do a quick plug both for Prince Edward Island lobsters and Maine lobsters. They're both delicious. Uh, no matter which one you can get hold of at a good price, definitely worth it. Now, no matter, what, no matter what happens in November, Lighthizer is, a, is likely to stay at the USTR, um, is likely to continue being the head of negotiations, I think. Um, Will Maudlin at the New York Times suggested that Lighthizer had clashed with Pompeo over the Taiwan talks. And Simon Lester from Cato said this played into a sort of broader belief that Lighthizer had a general reluctance to lower U.S. trade barriers, both technical and tariff. Um, will this attitude continue under either a, a Trump presidency or a Biden presidency? And will it continue in regards to the relation with the U.K.? There's no doubt that there are going to be a lot of assessments done on offensive and defensive interests. And obviously, the good news about U.S.-U.K. is that we elevate to talk about services and things like intellectual property, which will be refreshing, not least from the perspective of US observers. But it is true that there will be, like there were in the case of US-Japan negotiations, a lot of conversations about what the offense and defense ledger looks like, and there will be a lot of effort to finesse that, at least for the sake of political consumption. I would bet though that we have a pretty good read of the lay of the land by virtue of the fact that the high level working group has been up and running for quite some time. And moreover, so long as we stick to the technical side of writing the trade rules in a way that is somewhat behind the veil of ignorance, that will be the best way forward. We need to get this done properly. We need depth and breadth with respect to coverage on the regulatory side. We know that US-UK, like US-EU trade, is not held at mercy by virtue of tariffs. It will be the regulatory stuff. I don't doubt that a Lighthizer negotiating plank will be to do more of the managed trade that we are seeing. We're seeing, for example, here in the United States, talk about an early harvest with Brazil. That's going to be truly micromanaged. Phase one US-China, phase one US-Japan, micromanaged. Will Biden gravitate to a more comprehensive view? His comment on the stump trail has been that he wants to take a little while to take a moment to breathe and to revitalize US infrastructure. I would hope that his aides are telling him he has no time to do anything of the sort and that if it isn't a priority right away, it should be that he will have to be trying to keep pace with the European Union, which has thoroughly stepped into the void left by a lack of U.S. leadership and has been plugging up trade deals with 
partners that the U.S. lost when it withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. There will be a time when the U.S. has to re-engage, and the U.S. will not just have to deal with the EU, but it will have to go back to join TPP one day. And I mean, that is a, I mean, from my point of view, that's still quite an optimistic thing. I would like to see the United States uh, re-enter the Asia Pacific region as a major player. Of course, it's the largest economy in the world still. Um, the, in terms of the UK and the election is still happening, um, we're talking about at the moment, the, the internal markets bill, we're talking about the, 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 the Belfast agreement, um, lots of hyperbole about whether a no deal situation means borders, et cetera, um, or whether it means technical barriers to trade or not. Um, and a lot is made in the UK press, at least, of this meaning that Irish Americans will force the hand of Democrat candidates to, or like will force the election in towards Democrat position to block an idea of a deal. Is that a realistic threat? Um, and like, are the Irish American contingent in the United States as large as they once were? This is the first I'm hearing of anything like that. I seriously doubt that uh, trade is that salient in the minds of any voters at the moment. There are such bigger questions to be raised about U.S. politics going forward, and it really probably isn't a priority of any group to be thinking along those lines, least of all Irish Americans, who I really don't know the data, but would certainly... Uh, be concerned politically about any deal that was struck in the context of EU-UK. My sense, though, is that uh, the lines, as you're hearing, in terms of the American election in November are firm and largely intransigent. We're not seeing a lot of movement at the moment, and I have to say that it will be a matter of getting through the election before we're going to hear much intelligent deliberation about the nature and content of trade negotiations going forward. But for the sake of getting your listeners and the British voters thinking along the lines that certainly it should, they should, if it's not WTO plus, then it really isn't worth the political aggravation. And <laughs> that is the bottom line. That my, so the final question on this one, just yeah. broadly, when do you think, what, what kind of time frame do you expect a US-UK WTO plus deal uh, to be done in? I don't think anything's going to happen before, before we see the president, uh, before, before we see who wins and, and that person takes office in the new year. We had hoped, I thought, that a US-UK deal would be done by December. That I don't think is in the cards. And obviously you're hearing a lot of distractions on both sides, not least being dancing with other trade partners. So I would imagine that it will take a while for the dust to settle and it will take a while for the teams to reestablish. I'm not sure uh, how, that, how long that will take, but I wouldn't wager that anything much will happen before next spring. Yeah, I think you'll maybe well be right there. I don't think anyone on our side of the of the pond wants to attach a deal or detach a deal from whoever may win in November, and it's become and therefore because the to the deal becomes toxic in terms of its ratification uh, through a different Senate, a uh, different House. Um, just go back to China for a second. We're seeing a lot of moves in um, across the West, less so in the EU, but across, you know, Australia and, and Canada and Australia uh, and, and America um, and Japan as well and North South Korea to try and hold China to some standards that have been maybe not, it hasn't been held to for quite some time. Um, we're seeing pictures out of Xinjiang that look like forced labor camps. Uh, we're seeing lots of people boycotting goods or looking, moving to have you new know, Magnitsky sanctions against individuals. Um, is that a reasonable response to these, uh, to, to, to the actions that are happening out in China? Is it a sensible strategy for the US to pursue with allies? Um, and does, where does it leave free trade? And where does it leave China and Chinese citizens um, and, their luck, and their level of prosperity for the next couple of decades? I guess it comes down to what you mean by, is it working? Is it working politically? Sure. Is it working economically and for the sake of national security? Not so much. 
I have to say that I was struck recently at one of those DC cocktail parties populated by a lot of intelligence people who were bemoaning the fact that US Section 301 tariffs were coming at exactly the wrong time in terms of Chinese domestic politics and may not be good in the sense of securing US national security going forward by virtue of what they were doing domestically in the context of Chinese politics. In terms of what we're going to see in the future in, and, and on China in particular, I've got one big concern that I want to share with you. Namely, I worry about this language that the WTO somehow is only capable of dealing with homogeneous market capitalist societies and can't deal with whatever it is that we think China is. China has been sued quite heavily, deeply, and fully at the WTO. We seem to have enough transparency with respect to, say, Chinese subsidies that in one US case brought against China, there were 10 pages of subsidies cited as being potentially illegal under the WTO subsidies agreement. I worry that the next director general of the WTO is gonna inherit this narrative that somehow we have to deal with the uniqueness of China in a brand new way. I'm not sure that that really is borne out by, for example, the recent 301 filing here in the United States against Vietnam. And for that matter, let's not forget that the U.S. has also seen elements of state trading enterprises in both Canada and Australia. So I would worry if this got a little too in the popular press as being a truism that the WTO really can only handle 164 identical type varieties of capitalism. I think it's a much more robust institution than that. And I think it's quite capable of handling China net some rewrites of subsidy code laws. And I think as well, consumers in Western societies are quite capable of deciding what standards and what, what moral and ethical standards they're willing to accept in other countries and the goods that they buy as well. That's right. A trade agreement can't force any consumer to buy anything. A trade agreement can only provide a level playing field on which foreign competes with domestic and foreign is treated on par with other foreign, so long as they're all members of the same club. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we've seen in recent years, and Ray sort of brings it up, with, um, but I will rewire it slightly, Ray, um, about we're seeing new barriers brought in or being touted to be brought in um, for environmental reasons that oh, we've offset our carbon by exporting it or outsourcing it. And therefore, we need to have new barriers to things being coming in from poorer countries where things are made a little bit less green. Is this just another form of protectionism that, again, removes the agency of people to go, actually, this I know what I'm buying? Yes. And I got to say, I'm a bit of an outlier on this because I do see it in pretty black and white terms. Yes. And it comes down to one issue. A lot of these environmental concerns are perfectly correlated with distance. So they obviously put foreign at a disadvantage against domestic. And in that regard, I would be very concerned about the proliferation of things that begin to look like carbon taxes and the like. And there's ample opportunity for governments to cheat on things that sound like subsidies disciplines by virtue of touting the benefits of pushing more on renewable energy like wind and solar in the name of greening the economy, but really it's about a commercial plank. I have no doubt that the Environmental Goods Agreement as a plural ladder at the WTO will help us in going to a greener economy. But I do worry that at times it is, and most of the time potentially, it is just a disguise restriction on trade. Yeah, <laughs> as the good man Adam Smith himself, you know, right, that's what, that is effectively what import controls do. Uh, it that's aims right, at the impoverishment of our neighbors tend to render that, to, to, to tending to render that very commerce insignificant and contemptible. It's not all that different than arguing national security as a justification for a lot of these measures either. We know that a national security argument, like an environmental argument, will typically be correlated with other. And in as much as it is correlated with other, you've got a problem there. And that problem is one of the twin axioms of the WTO, namely national treatment. Now, I'm, we're going to very briefly sum up, um, and then I will thank everybody and head off. Uh, but Mark, I just want to give you that you have some final thoughts for a couple of minutes uh, as to what's coming our way, what you think is going to change in America's stance, um, and why we should be excited about global trade again. Sure. 
First of all, chlorinated chicken and things like it shouldn't be taken in a vacuum. They're part of a much bigger picture. And that much bigger picture is regulatory issues becoming the preferred means by which rich markets in particular defend themselves against both rich and poor exports. Now, my big sell for the future of free trade is let's start with reforming the WTO. The reality is that this pocketing of the global economy by virtue of preferential trade agreements here and there is no substitute for the level playing field that currently is for 164 members. Let's firm up the WTO and let's not forget that even when we do write these preferential trade agreements, as per their preamble, the recitals speak loudly to the respect for the WTO, for compliance with WTO principles, and moreover, some of our most technical chapters in these preferential trade agreements are actually delegating litigation to the WTO, including technical barriers to trade, including under USMCA. In other words, we've come full circle from forum shopping to anti-forum shopping on some of the most controversial provisions. And the reason is business doesn't like uncertainty. Let's remember why we're in this game. We get more trade, more investment, and more jobs, and more choice at point of sale with this kind of an opportunity. And the opportunity comes with a predictable and stable global economy. Before we go rushing into the esoteric, let's firm up the base. And the base is the WTO. It all starts with the WTO. After that, once we firmed it up, sure, let's go for the plus provisions. No one loves plus provisions more than I do. But... Let's start with the base. Once that's firm, then we know what to do. We know how to improve. We know literally the definition of WTO plus. But I fear that especially over the past few years, we have lost the conversation to a lot of misunderstandings about what was being pursued with these trade deals and where we are in net. And it's amazing, and I'll end with this point, that Ambassador Lighthizer came full circle from 2016 touting the benefit of bilats to now saying maybe we should re reform the WTO. You bet, because the playing field needs a base. And the base is, for all that's said and done with plus provisions, the WTO. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you heard the man. It is all about that base. It is all about that base. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. That was an incredibly enjoyable experience for me. I hope it was for you guys at home as well. Please do check out Tradecraft. Uh, Mark's podcast on uh, iTunes and SoundCloud, examining international law and policy. I'm sure we'll be hearing from him again. It was lovely to hear someone say so clearly and profoundly in black and white terms what needs to be done. Um, and I'll leave you with this thought from Adam Smith um, on the benefits of freedom. Because without trade restrictions, the obvious and simple system of natural liberty establishes itself of its own accord. Every man is left perfectly free to pursue his own interest in his own way. The sovereign is completely discharged from a duty for which no human wisdom or knowledge could ever be sufficient. The duty of superintending the industry of private people and of directing it towards the employments most suitable to the interests of the society. And that, good evening or good morning and good afternoon, no matter where you are in the world, because you are joining us from around the world. We hope to see you again.